Welcome back, everybody. This is part two of Oversimplified's Russian Revolution. Thank you so much for all the fantastic feedback yesterday, including everyone who paid close attention to the fact that I talked about this being our channel before a video about the Russian Revolution. I get it. I, I, I appreciate the irony of all of that. Yes, I consider this to be our channel, but I'm still the guy in charge that makes all the decisions and uploads the videos. So I guess you could consider me to be the uh, general secretary of this channel. So uh, not a lot to say up front. Just a reminder that if you haven't already done so, please subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you never miss any future content. Uh, I'm going to have some announcements about some upcoming trips uh, coming up here in the next week or two about when and where I'm going to be different places. So if you happen to live in that area and you want to join me as I make videos and tour battlefields, I would love to have you come out and meet me on the battlefield. I try to let you guys know those things in advance so that we can connect if at all possible. I think it's a lot of fun and might even get you involved in making the videos. So let's go ahead and dive into part two of Oversimplified's Russian Revolution. While Nicholas had been busy playing with his new best friend, tensions in Europe had been rising. It just so happened that in 1914, one Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary went for a drive with the top down in Sarajevo. One thing leads to another, and suddenly Russia found itself at war with half of Europe. A wave of patriotism swept through Russia. The capital was renamed to Petrograd because St. Petersburg sounded a bit too German. Even revolutionaries were getting on board. To them, World War I was a big stinky imperialist war, but they didn't want their big stinky imperialist replaced by a foreign one. So pretty much everyone wanted Russia to win. I hope Russia loses. Jeez, read the room, Lenin. Lenin hoped Russia would lose because that would help him overthrow the Tsar. As long as he did that, who cares if Germany blows up half the country? And blow up half the country, they did. So yeah, um, you know, a big part of Germany's thought process with this war is the idea of what they call the Schlieffen Plan, which is uh, Germany knew that if they went to war, it would be a two-front war. They would have to deal with France and Russia. Uh, so basically the big powers on either side. Uh, so the idea was rush through Belgium and take France out of the war in a few weeks, if possible, and then send all of your troops to the east because it's going to take big, slow Russia. And let's face it, Russia is a huge country that it's going to take them a long time to get mobilized. Well, Russia started mobilizing, and actually it was Russia's mobilization that kind of made the war inevitable. Uh, they got to the place where Russia had started to mobilize, and that was the sticking point. If Russia had stopped their mobilization, the war might not have happened. I mean, there were a lot of other things like that, but that was definitely one of the things that made it a no-turning-back kind of thing. But Russia mobilized a lot faster than Germany expected and had some real early initial success in the war, but then it kind of went the other direction after that. An inefficient czarist government meant there were shortages of just about everything you need to fight a war. And if losing a teensy-weensy war with Japan upset the people, losing a giant Wyatt war like this was much worse. Soldiers were deserting, the economy was imploding, and in no time, Russia was starving. The peasants were getting more peasanty, the workers were getting more workery, all the while Germany was getting more Germanery. Dimitri, we need to win this war. I need someone with a great military mind to step in and take control. You're right. How about General Hickelooper? How about me? You can't run the war. Who'll be in charge of the country while you're gone? Obviously, my German wife and a homeless wizard. Duh. Nick <laughs> my German wife and a homeless wizard. Now, his German wife, which is absolutely true, she is a first cousin to Kaiser Wilhelm, um, but they're all related to each other. Tsar Nicholas and King George V of England, their mothers were sisters. Um, Queen Victoria's uh, grandchildren were the King of, Eng uh, of the UK, uh, King George V. Wilhelm II was her oldest grandson. And the Tsarina of Russia were all three uh, grandchildren of Queen Victoria. And then Nicholas and Wilhelm were like second cousins once removed. Uh, they were also third cousins through another line, but so they're all related to each other. Nicholas declared himself commander in chief and went to the front lines, leaving his German wife in charge while they were fighting the Germans. It wasn't a good look. And because Alexander was so close to Rasputin, people believed that he was actually calling the shots and secretly destroying Russia and maybe even boinking her An even worse look. At this point, a bunch of nobles just couldn't take it anymore. Rasputin is destroying the country. We have to break his magic spell over the czar. But how? He's magic. Hmm. <laughs> so, 
this is one of those things you have to read and see the sources to see that it was legit true because everything that happened the night they killed Rasputin is just beyond ridiculous. Uh, you know, it, it feeds right into the uh, the mythology of the magic wizard guy that he was. Dude, very cool. Hey, it's Rasputin. The sexy party is running a little late, but in the meantime, why don't you try one of these totally not poisoned cakes? Dude, why'd you say it like that? He's totally going to know they're poisoned now. Shut up. I said they're not poisoned. <laughs> Dude. He just ate so much poison. How is he still alive? It must be the magic. Go with plan B. Shoot him. Is still he dead? alive. See, Boris? I told you he was the Antichrist and you didn't believe me. Can you shut up for one minute and help me roll him up? Are you sure he's dead? Yeah, I believe when they found, when they pulled his body from the, the frozen water, <laughs> that they found that he had still been alive when they threw him in, that he'd actually ended up drowning, or at least that he had some water in his lungs. Uh, so he'd been poisoned, shot, and then thrown into an icy river before he finally died. Dead? I don't know, but I'm supposed to be hosting a charity auction right now. Can we get this over with? Okay. Now he's dead. The murder of Rasputin, just like his life, is shrouded in mystery and speculation. He probably didn't really die like that, but he also probably didn't really heal people. He probably didn't influence the Tsar as much as people thought. He probably wasn't secretly destroying the country. But what he definitely did do, even in his death, was ruin the Tsar's reputation. And um, kind of as an aside, a little creepy, but it's true, Rasputin's man parts in a jar in a museum somewhere and, um, well, if you're not easily weirded out, Google it. It's something. Russia's autocracy looked more outdated than ever, and the Russian people were taking notice. Come on, men. Remember what we're fighting for. Yeah, no. We're out. World War I left Russia broke, hungry, and exhausted. And with Nicholas acting as commander-in-chief, he was getting even more blame. For the second time, Russia was on the brink of revolution. Yeah, and here's the thing. So Russia, you got to think about, they've been, it's been so fragile for the last, I don't know, 40 years or so between everything that happened with the previous two czars and now the things that have happened with Nicholas, uh, all of the, the times that things have been on the, on the edge of revolution anyway. And now you hurl this country into... Uh, the deadliest war in history to that point. And, you know, you can understand why this puts the the country in a really prime position for the uh, monarchy to be overthrown. By 1917, Russia had been fighting a war it couldn't afford for three years. They were running out of many things, most worryingly, food. On International Women's Day, 1917, thousands of hungry women in Petrograd were so sick of being hungry that they took to the streets. And it turns out it's not just women who experience hunger, but men too. So the next day they joined in as well. Gatherings on the streets were forbidden, but I'm not sure how you'd arrest 250,000 people. The crowds demanded an end to the war, an end to food rationing, and even an end to the Tsar's autocracy. Now, normally the troops would deal with this kind of thing, but as it turns out, soldiers get hungry too. And they were also tired of having to kill their fellow Russians so much. So entire regiments mutinied in the capital and they joined the crowd as well, trashing symbols of the Tsar and his autocratic regime. Things were escalating very quickly. Liberal politicians watching the riots in the streets had long been dissatisfied with the Tsar, since he would shut their parliament down anytime they did something he didn't like. They believed the only way to bring stability back to the streets was for Nicholas II to abdicate. So when these things happen, there are often moderate people who might be in favor of overthrowing the government but aren't willing to go to extreme measures. And then you have the radicals. This happened, for example, in France with the French Revolution. And in that case, the radicals initially won out, which is how you get the, the Great Terror, where you have thousands of people being beheaded. You know, in the United States, it was the more moderate people who won out. It could have gone the same way. There were some pretty radical people in the in the uh, American colonies that probably could have taken it to a more extreme place. Uh, in Germany, you have the communists who initially over you know, kind of take over the government, but then they're quickly um, superseded by a more moderate 
government with the Weimar Republic. So it's a constant struggle. It just so happened that in the case of the Russian Revolution, whereas the moderates initially went out, eventually the extremists take over. The riots continued. The police fired on soldiers. Soldiers fired on soldiers. The workers re-established the Petrograd Soviet. Politicians began arresting the Tsar's ministers. He may have been an autocrat, but he just lost complete control of his capital city. Talk about embarrassing. Nicholas, the troops have turned against us. The people have taken over the city. They've even cut my phone line. Hello? Hello? Hmm, the phones are down. Things must be bad. I'd better go back there. Nicholas hopped on the next train back to Petrograd, but he never made it to the city. His train was met by military generals and other politicians. What's going on? Nicholas, look, man, we need to talk. It's not you, it's us. Yeah. Oh, who am I kidding? No, it's definitely, definitely you. During the whole crisis in Petrograd, the liberals convinced the generals that if Nicholas abdicated, the people would calm down, and the generals were on board. They didn't have time to quell the chaos, because don't forget, they were still losing a global, all-encompassing war against the Germans. And with the military no longer on his side, Nicholas had no choice but to step down. Throughout his entire reign, he had done everything he could to keep all the power for himself. And in the end, that's exactly what left him with none. And, you know, isn't that an interesting thing is that often uh, the fear of something is what causes us to lose that thing. The more people uh, feel that they are out, they, the more people feel they don't have control, the more they try to take control. And that's kind of what happens here. The more he's losing control, the more he's exerting authority over people. And if he had just maybe given up a little bit of control, a little bit of that autonomy uh, back to the people, he probably could have held on to power. Uh, but that's not how he chose to do things. But then there was a big question. Who would replace Nicholas? Well, his son Alexei was next in line. Hey buddy, daddy couldn't handle the complex socioeconomic problems of a giant multinational multi-ethnic empire that's engaged in total war with all of Europe. You think you could give it a shot? <laughs> Alexei just wasn't ready to be Tsar. Nicholas did have a brother, but given the state of the empire, he wasn't keen either. And so, 300 years of Romanov rule in Russia just kind of came to an end. And if you look at the Romanov uh, family today, they do still exist, and there are a couple of different people who claim to be the heir to the throne. Uh, and one of those heirs, actually Nicholas's nearest relative, would be his sister's great-grandchildren who are American citizens. I think they live in California, uh, and they are among the claimants to the throne. In fact, I think his uh, Nicholas's one great-grandnephew, or maybe just a grandnephew, is like 98 years old and lives in California. The earlier 1905 revolution hadn't changed much, but this new revolution had left Russia without a czar. And still, before the year was over, there would be one more revolution left to come. Nicholas's failure as commander of the armed forces was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Do you think maybe you could have done any better? <laughs> well, guess what? It's time to find out in Rise of Kingdoms. Rise of Kingdoms is an epic, massive multiplayer, free-to-play, real-time strategy game. Choose from 11 historical civilizations, including Rome, China, or France. You can form alliances with other players or conquer the crap out of them in real-time strategic battles. Oh look, it's master tactician and handsome general, Alexander the Great. If you want my advice, the troop is the most important chess piece in a battle. In Rise of Kingdoms, each troop can be controlled. To win a battle, you need to utilize careful positioning through unique troop formations while using terrain to your advantage. I literally won the Battle of Gogamela with fewer troops by using superior strategy. You're wrong. Joan of Arc? That's right, noob. Listen up. I'm about to drop some knowledge. The commander's skill is way more important. Each Rise of Kingdoms commander has their own unique skill. Look at me. I've added attack and defense buffs to my troops. Whoa. I'm also able to cure my wounded soldiers. Cool. And I can increase their wood gathering speed by 10%. Uh, not as cool, but okay. In Rise of Kingdoms, the decision is yours. Now go ahead. Choose your favorite real historical figure and lead your troops into real-time battle. Download Rise of Kingdoms now for free by clicking on the link in the description below. Join me and 50 million other online players and guide your civilization from a lowly clan into a great empire. Now where was I? Oh yeah, Hungry Woman, Absolute Chaos, and the End of the Tsar.
Oh, hey guys, it says here there's been a revolution and the reign of the czars has ended. Oh, come on, I missed another one? Why am I even in this video? Well, it's not like you could have done anything. As long as there's a world war, you can't get back to Russia. Yeah. Who wants to start a revolution? I mean, a revolution. Dang it! Despite getting rid of Nick, Russia was still at war with half of Europe. The Germans, however, had an idea. They thought that if they helped Lenin get back, he would cause trouble for the new Russian government. So they put him on a train. Destination, Petrograd. It was a long journey, and while Lenin was cooped up in his train, things in Russia were changing. Workers were taking control of their factories. Soldiers were socking it to their mean old officers. Without a czar, a big old power vacuum had opened up. So think about the fact that Germany basically helped create the Soviet Union by bringing Lenin back. Uh, and imagine how that became a thorn in their side a generation later when the Soviets kind of became Adolf Hitler's mortal enemy. Uh, and it was something that they created in the first place. And someone needed to fill it. The liberals proposed they be in charge and they set up the provisional government. The workers, however, had already begun establishing local Soviets, largely controlled by the social revolutionaries and the Mensheviks. And since neither felt like they had the power to oust the other, Russia ended up in a classic dual power conundrum. The two coexisted, with the provisional government becoming the official government and the elected Soviets issuing orders to the workers and soldiers. This power balance was delicate, and all it would take is one bold revolutionary to come along and give everyone a big-brained beatdown. Oh boy, Lenin's coming home. I can't wait for him to see all the great things we've accomplished, and I'm gonna show him my fan art. Oh look, here he comes now. Shut up, shut up! You all suck! The provisional government sucks, the Soviet sucks, even your fan art sucks! <laughs> Why does he have to be so mean? In case you couldn't tell, Lenin wasn't a fan of everything that had been happening. In his April theses, he called the provisional government and the Soviets a bunch of big bourgeois bozos. And he kind of had a point. There was still a lot for the Russian people to be mad about. The provisional government hadn't got Russia out of the war, the people were still hungry, and the peasants were still hoping to get more land. Meanwhile, the Soviets hadn't done much to change things either. So it's funny how this happens. You often get rid of one government and replace it with a new one and really very little changes except for who's in charge. I'll give you a perfect example after the uh, English Civil War when uh, they fight against the monarchy, overthrow the monarchy. They put Oliver Cromwell in charge and he's basically a monarch in name uh, in everything but name uh, to where when he dies, the uh, the office of Lord Protector, which is basically a monarch without a crown, went to his son briefly after that. So very little changed. You just had a different name for the person in charge. But even though they weren't perfect, a lot of people did like what the new government had been doing. There was progress. The secret police were disbanded, the death penalty abolished. They even planned to hold elections, meaning for the first time ever, the Russian people could choose their own government. So think about the things that change here, because think about what's going to happen when the Soviets take over. You know, free elections, abolishing the death penalty, um, getting rid of the secret police. Well, what are three things that Stalin did a lot of? didn't do free elections, a lot of people got executed, and they most definitely had secret police. So they basically just reversed all of it when they went to the Soviet Union. To many, Lenin seemed like some out-of-touch weirdo. If Lenin wanted to go from whiny irrelevant zero to hunky communist hero, he'd need to shake things up a bit. So he and the Bolsheviks came up with a hot new slogan that promised to give the people what the provisional government wouldn't. Peace, don't like war? We'll end it, land. You want land? We'll give it to you. Bread. Hungry. Scooby dooby doo. Lenin also called for all power to the Soviets, which meant getting rid of the provisional government and having the Soviets run the place. A communist dream. The people liked these slogans, and bit by bit, the Bolsheviks became more popular. Some Mensheviks even began switching sides. But even though the people thought Lenin's slogans rocked, as long as the provisional government didn't mess up, they'd continue to support it. So let's check in on the provisional government. <laughs> oh, provisional government. You've made a big mess. The provisional government lasted for just nine months, but those nine months were chaos. The people wanted Russia out of World War I, but Minister of War Alexander Kerensky thought instead of doing that, why not do the exact opposite? Let's if the win. people saw more Russian victories, they'd have to support the new government. So here's another classic situation where people will turn to the extremists to get what they need. Uh, they need food. They need an end to the war. They need some very basic things 
that their existing government wasn't providing for them. And so they were willing to turn to anybody who offered a solution that would get them where they wanted to be. And in this case, they turned to the communists. And that went just about as well as you might expect. These heavy defeats worsened the Russian economy and made the hungry people hungrier. And by now, I think you know what comes next. They trashed the place. More looting, more rioting, more violence. It was like the Tsar had never abdicated. Tens of thousands of armed workers took to the streets during some of the worst violence Petrograd had seen yet. And in response, Kerensky called in the troops who opened fire on the demonstrators. For now, Lenin and other Bolshevik leaders wanted to distance themselves from the violence. So this is basically exactly what happened with the Tsar. Once again, you've got rioting in the streets. Once again, you call in the troops and they're, they're killing civilians in the streets. Nothing has changed. But the crowds marched under Bolshevik slogans. And as a result, Kerensky, now the prime minister, took the opportunity to stamp down on the Bolsheviks. Their leaders were arrested. Lenin was accused of being a German agent and he was forced to flee to Finland in disguise. This sucks. Now I'll never get to have my revolution. Why are you wearing a dress? It's a disguise, idiot. And it makes me feel pretty. Kerensky had successfully dealt with the violence, but he just couldn't catch a break. This increasing support for more extreme forms of socialism, along with the poor handling of the war, alarmed traditional liberals and bougie business boys. To appease them, Kerensky decided to promote a military legend to supreme commander of the armed forces. Someone who hated the revolution, loved the death penalty, and was devoutly anti-socialist, General Kornilov. Hey man, thanks for the promotion. That was real swell of you. Of course, with you by my side, who would dare try to overthrow me? How about... Me. Me. <laughs> I did not see this coming. Unfortunately for Kerensky, Kornilov hated the liberal and socialist reforms of the new government, particularly the dumb socialist soldiers committees. The army was no place for undisciplined left-wing snowflakes. Fearing a Bolshevik takeover was imminent, Kornilov ordered his men towards Petrograd to oust the Soviet and take over. Kerensky freaked out and he needed help. Since he knew Trotsky was finger licking good at organizing, he. <laughs> so, finger licking good, obviously, that's a reference to the fact that Trotsky looks like Colonel Sanders from KFC. Kerensky freaked out and he needed help. Since he knew Trotsky was finger licking good at organizing, he and other Bolshevik leaders were released, and they, along with the Soviet, organized the defense of Petrograd. Kornilov had the power of soldiers, but the Soviet had the power of workers, and they did what workers do best. Railroad workers diverted Kornilov's men away. Telegraph workers messed with his communications. They even infiltrated his forces and encouraged the demoralized men to desert. They were also armed en masse, but in the end, no fighting was necessary because Kornilov's coup just fell apart and Kornilov was sent straight to prison. Everything was coming up Kerensky. Hey, thanks for the help, boys. Couldn't have done it without you. Now that there's no longer any threat, how about you uh, return all those guns I gave you? <laughs> no. So you can see it's a comedy of errors. He basically creates the conditions in which his government gets overthrown by equipping and arming and providing the opportunity for the very people that end up doing it. Oh, no. In order to kill a rat, Kerensky had just given a gun to a bear, a Bolshevik bear. The whole affair was a huge propaganda win for them. They had defended the revolution and their popularity skyrocketed. They found themselves elected to the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets, with Trotsky even becoming chairman in Petrograd. They were now in a very powerful position, almost powerful enough for Lenin to return home from Finland and finally stage his long-awaited communist revolution. The Bolsheviks began planning their takeover of the Russian government. Some got cold feet and began arguing against Lenin's armed revolution in favor of a more peaceful approach. And they even wrote newspaper articles about it, which kind of gave the whole scheme away. The Bolsheviks are planning an armed revolution? I did not see this coming. <laughs> Kerensky began arresting Bolsheviks, and as a result, Lenin and the boys felt they had no choice but to commence the revolution right now. Lenin was back in Petrograd, but was still in hiding, so Trotsky got the ball rolling, using his position as Soviet chairman to organize the Bolshevik militias. Now, if you were to ask Soviet artists, the revolution went something like this. <laughs> as much as they would like you to think it was a glorious, violent, heroic takeover, the truth seems to be a little more underwhelming. And I should point out, too, that you notice that Trotsky is the guy who kind of gets the ball rolling in favor of, for Lenin. And again, this is a situation where, although it's a while down the road, Trotsky is equipping the means of his eventual demise of his own. The Bolsheviks just kind of walked into key buildings in the city and took control. Bolshevik supporting sailors even brought in a huge battleship, but there wasn't really any fighting. Nobody really tried to stop them. 
In just one day, they took control of the city. Next, Kerensky just managed to escape before the Bolsheviks surrounded the Winter Palace, placing the provisional government under siege inside. Is it safe to come out yet? I think so. Fear my revolutionary might! Give me that. That night, Lenin came out of hiding to play a bigger role in the revolution. With him back at the helm, they had one more job to do. Storm the Winter Palace and arrest the provisional government. And here comes the final showdown. The palace was defended by a force known as the Battalion of Death. Probably not the people you want to go in and attack, right? I mean, the Battalion of Death. Uh, you can imagine how that's going to go. Who immediately gave up and just... <laughs> Wait, okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. I was expecting something a little different there. They just gave up. Okay. It's like that. Lenin had won. As far as violent, bloody revolutionary uprisings go, this wasn't really one of them. But Lenin was finally in charge of Russia. He had spent his whole life dreaming of this moment. He set up the first council of people's commissars, his own cabinet, with him in charge. This was it. His chance to finally make his communist utopia with equality and freedoms beyond compare. Hey, Lenin, before we wait, took... Wait, wait. Can we just stop a second? Was that were, are those the people from the Tiger King thing? I've never watched it, so I don't know. But yeah, okay, cool. Let's move on. It's communist utopia with equality and freedoms beyond compare. Hey, Lenin. Before we took power, they were planning on holding elections. Shall we go ahead with those? Of course. You can't have a communist utopia without high levels of political participation. The proletariat should be free to we elect lost. who it. <laughs> the social revolutionaries won. We lost. Those don't count. Lenin claimed the elections were unfair, and the constituent assembly they created was counter-revolutionary. He presented the new assembly with a motion that basically said, sign here and give up your power. And when the assembly was like, no, Lenin said, see, they're disobeying me. Proof they're counter-revolutionary. Shut it down, boys. Moderate socialists and others weren't happy when Lenin had the assembly closed by force. And when campaigners began taking to the streets, they were fired upon. For Lenin, setting up a communist utopia was looking suspiciously like setting up a dictatorship. So here we have a third straight government that fires on people in the streets that disagree with them or that protest against them. It's just, it doesn't seem to matter who's in charge. They get the exact same result. While he was implementing many of the communist policies you'd expect, he was also refusing to work with other political parties and cracking down on opposition. Hey Lenin, are you setting up a dictatorship? I'll shoot you if you are. Of course not. What a crazy theory. Anyway, I'm pleased to announce I'm setting up a secret police force to repress and kill traitors. And by traitors, I of course mean anyone not loyal to me. Owie, 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 owie. The assassination attempt made on Lenin's life in August 1918 failed. But in response, the Bolsheviks ramped up their oppression. But while all of this chaos was erupting back home, Lenin and the boys were also distracted by another problem. They were still at war with the Germans, and they had promised to give the people peace. So Lenin made Trotsky commissar for foreign affairs, and sent him off to negotiate a peace deal with the Germans. The Germans offered Trotsky really harsh terms, you know, because they were winning the war. They demanded Russia give up a butt-ton of land, something that would be devastating to the economy. Look, I know it's not great, but I think we have to accept it. Are you insane? This will ruin us! Hey Trotsky, you got a big brain, what do you think? How about no war, no peace? What's that, Mr. Trotsky, sir? It's simple. No war means we'll stop fighting the Germans, but no peace means we won't sign the peace treaty either. Then, when the Germans see we've just stopped fighting, they'll have to leave us alone. Or so, simple enough, right? We'll just stop fighting, and, and what could possibly go wrong? Something. Trotsky, that's genius. I could kiss you. Do you want me to kiss you? Stop asking me that. Trotsky's no war, no peace plan was a huge success. Oh, wait, no, just no, kidding. It it went exactly as you'd imagine. When the Germans saw the Russians had stopped fighting, they slammed 700,000 troops deep into Russian territory with no resistance. Now, the new peace treaty offered by the Germans was way worse, with Russia losing a huge amount of territory, population, and resources. The Bolsheviks had no choice but to accept, and Russia was humiliated. With Petrograd now in an exposed position, Lenin moved the capital to Moscow, just in case. Things really weren't going well for Lenin, and many, many people were extremely unhappy with the Bolshevik government and its actions. Lenin, you've pissed off so many people that they've united against you. We're under attack. Relax, we always expected some counter-revolutionary pushback. I think we can handle More a few angry some. monopoly men. But Lenin, it's not just the monopoly men. Okay, who are we up against? Well, the liberals, the social revolutionaries, national separatists in Poland, Finland, and the Ukraine, independent warlords setting up chiefdoms, anarchist rebels, the green peasant armies, the Cossacks, the Caucasian states, the Baltic states, the British, the French, the Americans, and the Japanese. Oh, and a legion of Czechoslovakian soldiers seem to have taken over the Trans-Siberian Railway and stolen all the imperial gold reserves. 
What? How could this get any worse? Oh, and it says here your mother-in-law is coming to stay. <laughs> no! A variety of anti-Bolshevik forces had united together to topple Lenin's government, and Russia descended into a full-blown civil war. And look at, I mean, obviously, you know, most of where the words are, where it says Russian Civil War, there's very few people there. Most of the people live in the other half. But uh, the vast majority of the country is against them. But they win. Now, the Russian Civil War was extremely intricate and would really need its own video. But essentially, the anti-Bolshevik white movement gained control of vast underdeveloped areas, while the Bolshevik Reds controlled the industrial heartland. Using this to their advantage, along with the surprising military genius of Trotsky and the shocking disorganization of the White Army, the fortified Red Army gradually came out on top. It was an absolutely brutal conflict, with both sides committing horrendous atrocities. To maintain order at home, the Bolsheviks began the Red Terror, and the secret police would execute tens of thousands of suspected traitors. No one was safe from the violence, not even Nicholas. And you would think that when all this was happening, that you would get out of there as quickly as you could. And the, the Romanovs tried. They actually appealed to their family in, uh, in the UK, and they were denied permission to, uh, to flee to the UK. And of course, you can imagine how uh, King George V and his family felt after Nicholas, his wife, and their children were all brutally murdered. And eventually they did allow the other survivors of the family asylum. Himself. You've probably been wondering what Nicholas has been up to this whole time. Well, after his abdication, he and his family were placed under house arrest. At first, they were allowed to live in their usual luxury. But after Lenin took over, their conditions worsened. The Bolsheviks were just holding on to Nick until they could work out what to do with him. And when when uh, the Romanov family had gone into exile and when they had been basically placed under house arrest, they had actually sewn a bunch of their royal jewelry into their clothing so that they could escape with it. And they were actually wearing a lot of that when they were shot. And some of those jewels actually were deflecting some of the bullets and made it a little harder to kill them. But the Civil War complicated things. The last thing they wanted was for Nick to be freed by the white armies. And so, to stop this from happening, Nicholas's Bolshevik guards decided to act. It's not entirely certain whether Lenin ordered it, or if the guards were acting on their own volition. But on July 17th, 1918, with white armies approaching, they woke Nicholas and his family in the middle of the night and brought them into the basement. There, a drunken squad of Bolsheviks murdered the entire family. Nicholas. The last czar, once one of the most powerful men alive, had met a brutal end. And they, they buried them in two different places, I think, nearby. And it was only in the last couple of decades that they recovered the remains and identified all of them. And they've actually all been given reburials in a place of honor. They had a funeral for them. You can find the YouTube videos of them uh, bringing the, the coffins in and uh, having a funeral service for them. But after years of fighting, and millions of deaths. Trotsky and his Red Army came out victorious. Wow, that was a close one. Okay, back to creating a communist utopia. How are we doing on that? Well, the Civil War helped create a massive famine and about five million people starved to death. There's massive inflation and the ruble is worthless. Hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of railway track have been destroyed. Disease and epidemics have killed three million. The population of Moscow and Petrograd has collapsed. Life expectancy has plummeted. Sailors in Kronstadt are rebelling. People are freezing to death in their- And Lenin, this is probably a good, good time for you to just die and leave it to somebody else. In apartments and life has been reduced to a constant search for food and shelter. Whoa, well, this just means I'll have to work twice as hard. Day and night to save the country. Stroke. Nothing will stop me. Short of a couple of sudden strokes. Get the doctor. One thing you have to keep in mind is that everything I've been talking about, the civil war, the assassination attempt, and Lenin's struggle to maintain control at home, were all happening around the same time. And it must have been extremely stressful. Lenin began getting headaches, insomnia, and in 1922, he suffered two separate strokes. As the Soviet Union was officially declared under a strict one-party system, Lenin's health continued to decline, and his ability to lead the Communist Party went with it. Everybody assumed Trotsky would succeed him. He was a great speaker, he'd won the Civil War, and he had a dope-ass train. The last person anyone expected to take over was Stalin. And it was the last person Lenin wanted to take over. Lenin did not want to leave the government in Stalin's hands. But unfortunately, he had put Stalin in the perfect position within the government to where he could orchestrate a takeover of the government. Stalin wasn't a great intellectual like Lenin or a charismatic war hero like Trotsky. He was, as one Menshevik described him, a great blur. Someone who operated in the background. Someone 
who you might not even notice, but it was in the background that Stalin would rise to power. Here's how it happened. After the revolution, all the Bolsheviks hoped to get a cool job in the new government. What did you get? Commissar for war. Sweet. What'd you get? Secretary. <laughs> Stalin was made general secretary for the Communist Party. It wasn't what he wanted, but Stalin quickly realized that even though it wasn't fancy, it was a powerful position. As secretary, he had the power to give people jobs within the party. So he would give jobs to all of his pals, who in turn would give him their support. The more pals he gave jobs, the more power he got. The more power he got, the more pals he got. Lenin may have been having wall-to-wall -wall strokes, but he was still involved in the party, and he was taking notice. He wasn't a fan of Stalin abusing his position or insulting his wife to her face. Lenin knew he couldn't let Stalin take over, but by this stage, he was just too sick to fight it. Hey man, tell whoever's in charge of giving people jobs not to let that jerk Stalin become the next leader. <laughs> by the way, who did I put in charge of giving people jobs? That would be Stalin, sir. Blah. Whoa. Deja vu. Lenin's last wish was to not let Stalin take over, but by the time he died, Stalin was too powerful to remove. He had his remaining opponents arrested or killed. Trotsky was banished and fled to Europe. Eventually, he would be assassinated by Soviet spies in 1940. Mexico. Our dear comrade Lenin has died. We should have a state funeral. No. Let's mummify him and put him on display so people can look at his dead body forever. That's gross. You're gross. Guards, kill him. Lenin had waited so long to take control in Russia. But he never got to see his communist utopia. His short time in charge was spent dealing with the destroyed Russian economy, World War I, and the Civil War. An interesting thing, too, that both Lenin and Stalin, those were not their birth names. They both went by aliases. Um, I think uh, one of them was Zhukashvili or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, so they, Joseph Stalin basically means Joe Steele. That was his name. It sounded tough, you know, so uh, just kind of an aside. He was cruel and merciless, but he really did seem to believe communism would make Russia a better place. Stalin, on the other hand, would take the Soviet Union down a different path. If you thought Lenin was a tyrant, well, you ain't seen nothing yet, girl. A secret police state, a rapidly militarizing superpower led by a paranoid man who deeply distrusted the West would see the world come to the brink of nuclear annihilation. That's right, I'm talking about. And we will get to that one. So, you know, it's one of the cool things about these oversimplified videos is that they show you how each event ties into the others. You know, without... Uh, what happened in the Napoleonic Wars, we don't get World War I. Without World War I, we don't get the Russian Revolution. We don't get World War II. We don't get the Cold War. You know, all of these things are dominoes that kind of create the other ones. So kind of cool. I would love to hear your thoughts about all of that. That was a lot of stuff that we covered right there, but use the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe. Make sure you check out the original content creator, and I will see you again soon with another video. Thanks for watching.